Lord God, what sweet words those are and truths those are about the grace that you've bestowed on us as believers, Lord. Thank you for that. Bless our time as we come upon communion to remember you and the sacrifice you made on the cross so that we could receive that grace, Lord. In your name, amen. Hello, thank you for being here today. Um, I've been looking forward to spending the next 10 minutes with you. And as we prepare to take communion, um, there should be men with Bibles. All right, there are, there's men with Bibles. Um, if you don't have one, go ahead and raise your hand and they'll put one in your hand. And we'll be looking at Nahum chapter one today. So go ahead and turn there. This has kind of been a tough week. With Michael Kiwi's passing a week ago Friday, I think many of us are heartbroken to not have our dear brother with us anymore. We know that his faith has been turned to sight and we can take great joy in the fact that he is in the presence of our Lord worshiping him for eternity. But it's still very hard for those of us that are here because we miss him and that's okay. A year ago last Tuesday, my nephew Caleb passed away in a tragic accident. And as the one year anniversary of his homegoing approached, it weighed heavy on my heart as well. In those days following his death, Nahum 1-7 was on my mind a lot. So as I was preparing for this message, knowing it would come this week, that verse came right back to mind. So much so I couldn't think of anything else to talk about this morning. So we're gonna look at Nahum 1-7 and be reminded of the goodness of God. Let's read it together. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. This verse contains three truths about our Lord. So let's break each one down. The Lord is good. What does it mean for us to hear that the Lord is good? Webster defines good as being a favorable character or tendency. There's other definitions, virtuous, right, commendable, kind, benevolent. That gives us a direction, but it's really insufficient when we're defining God as good. He doesn't just do good or have good within him. He isn't just virtuous or commendable or kind. He is the definition of good. All that embodies the word good is God's essence. All that is God's essence is good. So when we see things that we think are good, we know they are only as good as God made them that way. And when we see circumstances that aren't good, we know they're only um, as good as God made them that way. Spurgeon has a quote that has been really helpful for me. He says, when your circumstances are not as you desire, it should only stir us up more heartily to give thanks unto the Lord, because he is good. And when, our, when we ourselves are conscious that we are far from being good, we should only more reverently bless him that he is good. We must never tolerate an instant of unbelief as to the goodness of the Lord. Whatever else may be questioned, this is absolutely certain. Jehovah is good. His dispensations may vary, but his nature is always the same. The second phrase in Nahum 1.7 is the Lord is a stronghold in the day of trouble. This passage was especially meaningful to Martin Luther, who undoubtedly found it as a source of comfort in his own difficulties during the Reformation. He called verse 7 an outstanding statement overflowing with consolation. He said, we must relate and apply it, not merely to the trial of Judah, but to absolutely every day of our trials and adversities, so that we may learn to flee for refuge in any trial at all to this sweetness of the Lord, as if to a holy anchorage. The Lord is a sweet stronghold at the very time when we are greatly afflicted. The word stronghold is like a fortress. It's a place of refuge to protect. When you think about castles and fortresses, there was a time when they were going to battle and they would go into the stronghold and they would see that as a place of comfort and they would know that this fortress that they built protected them from any outside enemy that would attack them. 
So when we think about God being a stronghold, he is a place of comfort for us in a trial. I love that this verse first reminds us that God is good and then that he is a place of comfort. His attribute of goodness gives us reassurance that there is comfort in him. The last phrase, the Lord knows those who take refuge in him. He is our protector if we take refuge in him. But how do we do that? First, we have to believe the gospel. Romans 5.12 says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men upon which all sinned. And then in verse 18, it says, so then as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification to life of life to all men. That one act was when God the Father sent his son to the cross to die for the sins of those whom the Father chose. Christ's death on the cross gave you a path away from death. Death entered in one act and death was defeated in one act. Adam brought deserved punishment, Christ brought undeserved mercy. We can only take refuge in him through that mercy by putting our faith in Jesus that his death saved us of our sin. As we come to the Lord's table this morning, we need to remember that the Lord is good. We need to remember that his stronghold is the only one that provides true comfort, and we need to take refuge in him. If you do not put your faith and trust in Christ and his death on the cross, we're so glad you're here, but we'd ask that you spend this time thinking about how God could be your refuge in time of trouble. But please let the cup and the bread pass by because this is a time for those that remember the breadth of God's loving kindness towards us. Men, please serve us. Take communion on your own and I'll come back and close our time in prayer.